Originally, my plan was to talk about two pieces of recent work uh, <coughs> that, that we've uh, sort of recently been doing. Um, and then I realized that if I did that, uh, instead of a 45 minute talk, it would easily end up taking two hours. And so um, I completely cut one of the things, uh, but still I think I have more than uh, enough to talk about. And so um, what I'm gonna tell you about, as soon as this comes back up, is uh, a method that we've been developing recently to try to handle the problem of uncertainty in the quantification of transcriptomics data using RNA sequence. And uh, what we are looking to do is to develop a general algorithm that is data-driven that will determine uh, the appropriate resolution in which to analyze your data. And uh, the analogy here is that, um, or I should, I should say the issue here is that most people decide to do a transcriptomic analysis uh, choosing a priori the resolution of which the analysis will be done, either at the level of genes or at the level of transcripts. Um, and the data often support some intermediate resolution between these. Uh, there are groups of transcripts that in a given sample are inferentially indistinguishable and can't be properly treated independently by an inference method. And then there are uh, transcripts that even though they belong to the same gene are easily distinguishable from the data. And so what we look to do is to develop a method that is able to figure out naturally what these groupings are. Okay, so who here is familiar with RNA-seq? So most, almost everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna give a one slide overview of the basics of RNA-seq here. Um, so the idea is that uh, we have the genome here, a eukaryotic genome imagined, for example, human. Um, and the process of transcription <laughs> takes us from the DNA to the unspliced uh, RNA. And then uh, splicing occurs, which often produces alternative isoforms of the same gene, uh, which may or may not be functionally distinct. And then this is the thing that we end up sequencing, right? So we sequence small bits of these molecules. And the goal in quantification is to try to infer the abundance of the distinct original molecules from only these small sequencing ones. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for a couple of reasons. Here's one reason why it's a challenge. If I ask where did this read come from, it's a pretty easy question to answer. There's only one place where the sequence of the read matches the sequence of the transcript. Well, on the other hand, if I ask where this read came from, at the level of the distinct transcript isoforms, it's less easy. Right? Possibly this read came from this transcript, possibly it came from the one in the center, all right? Um, and this is a low degree of multi-mapping. What we observe is that in a typical human RNA-seq experiment using short Illumina reads, somewhere around 80% of the reads map to multiple distinct isoforms. And so uh, this is a problem that has been studied for quite a long time. Uh, most approaches for transcript level quantification either adopt the model that was originally proposed by uh, Bo Lee et al, or some modification or addition of it to perform transcript quantification. Um, and the idea behind this model is to pose the problem of inferring the abundances of the original molecules in a maximum likelihood framework. So the idea is to sort of briefly walk through this equation. We want to find the parameters here, eta, the transcript abundances that um, are maximum given the set of observed fragments and the set of transcripts that we know could have produced them. Okay? And so the likelihood equation says that the likelihood of a particular set of parameters is proportional to the product over all of the reads, okay, so we're assuming every read is generated independently, um, times the sum over all transcripts of the probability of choosing that transcript to generate a read, given the transcript abundances, times the probability of observing this particular fragment, given that it came from this transcript. Right, so it's, it's a fairly simple and straightforward generative model, but that's also why it's so popular. Um, and I don't want to give you the uh, illusion that this is by any means the only piece of work. And so what I've thrown up here is just sort of a spattering of different methods that adopt either uh, this underlying model and try to speed up inference in the model, or try to extend the model in some way. Um, some of them try to do a different type of inference altogether. So for example, uh, this paper uses variational Bayesian optimization to try to find a, a maximum likelihood solution, uh, whereas um, this paper uses a fully Bayesian sampler to try to find the posterior distribution of the parameters rather than just the maximum likelihood estimation. So there's a lot of interesting work in this area. Um, I want to sort of give you a brief overview about why one reason maybe this model is so popular is the update equations are fairly simple. 
So what I'm showing here is um, the variational Bayesian EM iteration rule that tells us how to uh, infer at time step u plus 1 the abundances of all of our transcripts given the abundances at the previous time step that we have all right, and um, the, the, there's something interesting about this equation. You can see this is a sum uh, over uh, a set of things that are not the transcripts. Um, it's over a set of objects called equivalence classes that I will talk about in a second. Um, so this is one of the, the tricks that has been used to vastly speed up the statistical estimation of transcript abundance used by a number of different tools. Um, and I just want to sort of point out here that uh, all of these tools are tied together and that they assume a very similar underlying probabilistic generative model. Um, and then they use varying inference algorithms to try to resolve the parameters in this model. So expectation maximization, variational Bayesian EM, uh, variational inference using natural gradient descent, uh, and fully Bayesian samplers. There's some other methods too that look at things like least squared. So what is the idea of these equivalence classes? Um, I, I bring this up because it's going to be important to the topic I talk about uh, later. So um, the original likelihood that we're trying to optimize requires us to evaluate a product over all of the reads and then a sum over all of the transcripts. That inner sum can be reduced to only the transcripts to which the reads map. The assumption being that if a read doesn't map to a transcript, the probability that that transcript generated that read is essentially zero. However, what we observe is because the structure of multimapping in the transcriptome is not random, it's highly structured, it's induced by alternative splicing. Even though many reads map to many transcripts, the distinct patterns of multimapping are low dimensional. And so that's what this cartoon is illustrating. So imagine that I have this example with four sequenced fragments um, and transcripts A through F in my annotated transcriptome. I actually only observe two different distinct types of reads. There's the type of read that maps to transcript B and E, um, and there, sorry, the type of read that maps to transcript uh, C, and then the type of read that maps to transcript B and E, right? So despite the fact that there are four fragments here, there's only two types of fragments. And so the assumption that's made when we use these equivalence classes to speed up inference is that these are the sufficient statistics of the model that we care about. Right, so what this table down here is showing is the pattern of multi-mapping you observe. So the pattern here is BE. There are two such reads. Um, and then you can associate extra information with those reads. So for example, what is the conditional probability given that this transcript was compatible, this read was compatible with transcripts B and A, that it came from B versus that it came from A. Okay? Um, this idea goes back quite far in the RNA-seq literature, uh, at least to the, um, the work of Carroll et al. in 2011 in MMC. Uh, that define a tra uh, transcript abundance estimation methodology that worked over this reduced representation um, and showed it to be much, much faster than the full model um, implemented by Leon. Um, but you give something up when you do this, right? So what do you give up? Um, the original likelihood that you wanted to optimize was this one here. Uh, it's a product over all fragments and then a sum over all alignments. And instead, you're approximating it by this, which is saying, I have a product over all patterns of multimapping, and then a sum over all of the reads that have that pattern. And the specific thing that you're giving up is that this conditional probability here in the original equation can vary per fragment. Every read can have a separate conditional probability. But here, the conditional probability is fixed per equivalence class. So all of the reads with the same multimapping pattern have to have the same conditional probability for each of the transcripts. That's why this is an approximate likelihood. Um, so people have looked at this. Uh, we have a paper about this that looks how you can uh, redefine the equivalence relation to regain some of the accuracy that's lost there. Uh, there's another paper that uses a different notion of equivalence that is not lossy. Um, that's an important topic, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I want to talk about is um, one of the fundamental problems that you run into when you use any uh, maximum likelihood based method, which is that um, these generative statistical models that we have are a very elegant way to model the RNA-seq experiment and to invert it to do inference, and they can be optimized efficiently, but they almost all return point estimates of the abundances, right? Um, that is, they don't give you an idea of how certain we are about the computed abundance of a transcript, and uh, the value that you get can depend on a lot of things, like the initialization parameters of the algorithm, 
Um, and there are certain types of variance that happen in these experiments that you really want to account for. Right? So you have technical variance. Uh, this is an artifact of the sequencing procedure itself. If I sequence the exact same sample again, think of a technical replicate, I would get a potentially different abundances because I would have a different set of fragments. The exact things I sequence would be different. The other is inherent to inference. Even if I looked at exactly the same set of fragments and I ran my statistical inference procedure using different initialization uh, or I got stuck into a different little optima, I could get different abundances. Okay? And so it's a hard problem because we're trying to find the best parameters in a space of tens to hundreds of thousands of parameters. Each parameter, uh, each element of the parameter vector is in a transcript abundance. Um, and so we're prone to finding local optima. Okay? And even if we found a global optima, there could be many very near optimal solutions that look very similar. So um, there are a number of approaches to try to handle this problem. Uh, you could do a fully Bayesian inference. This is what uh, the tool BitSeq does. Uh, it's very, very accurate, but it's unfortunately too slow to be used in practice um, for large samples. You can do posterior Gibbs sampling. Um, so our tool, Salmon, uh, gives you this option. Uh, the idea is to start from the maximum likelihood estimate and then walk around the parameter space doing Gibbs sampling to get a notion of the variance in the posterior distribution. Um, you can also do bootstrap sampling. So here the idea is to either resample the reads themselves and redo the inference, or resample from the sufficient statistics, the counts of these equivalence classes, uh, to get some estimate of the certainty of your maximum likelihood. Um, and so I want to try to convince you that these uncertainties actually matter. Um, it's not just some small variance in a, a small number of transcripts, but actually um, you have posterior distributions that suggests to you that you might not want to trust the maximum likelihood estimate at all. So this uh, is a figure from the PhD thesis of uh, Peter Glaus, um, and it's showing the posterior distributions for the abundance of three different transcript isoforms. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, the, the dotted line is what you would get from a, a maximum likelihood estimate. Um, and so it's clear that the, the red transcript variant is most highly expressed but the range of uncertainty in the abundance of the blue and green transcripts suggests that you don't really want to confidently say, for example, the green transcript is more abundant than the blue one. Okay? Um, one thing that makes this even more difficult is that these variances are not independent. Right? The, the problem is we have a high dimensional quantity that we want to do inference over, and the um, elements of the parameter vector are correlated. Right? If two transcripts are very similar, and they share a large number of exons, Attributing reads to one of these necessarily means the other one must be less abundant. Okay? And so what these plots down here are showing, again, from Peter Glaus's thesis, um, is on the x-axis the uh, abundance of one transcript, and on the y-axis the abundance of others is a density plot. And the takeaway message from this is you can see for pairs of transcripts, there's a clear anti-correlation in the posterior abundances. The more abundant one transcript is, the less abundant the other one has to be. And that's because there is a set of reads that multimap to these transcripts, and if I choose to attribute the reads to one of these transcripts, it necessarily cannot be attributed to the other. Okay? And so uh, one more slide to try to drive home this point. Uh, this is a plot showing on the x-axis the mean count for uh, a transcript, and on the y-axis the variance of the posterior distribution. Um, and the red line is what you would get um, if there was no extra added uncertainty, if this just sort of followed a Poisson process. What we see is there's a lot of extra dispersion. Okay? So there are many transcripts whose uh, posterior variance is much higher than you would predict uh, if they were just sort of these independent variables sampled according to a Poisson process. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on this as well. Um, but that's also not what I'm going to talk about today. But this is very close. So now this is going to motivate exactly what I want to talk about. Um, you have. Um, this problem that simply knowing the uncertainty is not necessarily enough. Okay? Sometimes uh, accurate transcript level quantification might not be possible, um, but accurate quantification to specific groups of transcripts might be. And that group might be less than the entire gene. So what I'm showing here is just sort of a motivating uh, example cartoon. Um, you have two transcripts, the blue one and the orange one, and this is the histogram of the posterior counts, right? So you can imagine it's saying that most of the time the blue transcript had around 600 reads attributed to it. The orange transcript had this weird sort of looking distribution. 
But if I were to sum together in each posterior sample the reads attributed to the orange transcript and the blue transcript, the variance of that distribution would be very small. This happens precisely when these things are anti-correlated, precisely when giving reads to one implies I'm taking reads away from the other. Okay, and so these are exactly places in the transcript inference where combining small groups of transcripts can vastly decrease the uncertainty in the quantification estimates you get. And so what we would like to do is have a data-driven way to find such groups where the transcripts can't be quantified confidently, independently, but if we simply put them together, we now have a transcriptional unit that has a, a highly confident quantification. Okay? Um, so it's true that people already do this to a large extent in most RNA-seq studies, right? So despite the uh, advances that we've made in transcript quantification, uh, gene-level analysis is still vastly popular, right? A lot of people do gene-level analysis of RNA-seq. Um, and I want you to think of that as one end of the spectrum, right? We have this spectrum where on one end is transcript resolution, which sometimes we can achieve and sometimes we can't. On the other end is gene-level resolution, which is uh, usually highly robust but uh, which is too coarse grained in a sense, right? We might be able to tell functional differences at the subgene level. And also sometimes it might not be coarse grained enough. If you have families of very similar parologous genes, for example, they might have exactly the same problem the transcripts have, right? You might want to group those parologous genes together before you do differential testing. Um, and so what I'm showing here is um, just sort of to, to, to give you an idea of this relationship. This is at the gene level and at the transcript level. Um, showing the, uh, the statistic, uh, which is called, which we're calling the inferential relative variance, uh, which is sort of like the coefficient of variation, except we're looking at the variance rather than the standard deviation. Um, and so what I want, want you to take away from this is that at the gene level, the um, inferential relative variance is, is quite small, right? At the transcript level, it's immense, okay? And so um, you absolutely have to take care of this uncertainty when you're doing transcript level inference. You don't have to worry about it as much when you're doing gene level inference, but it still does happen sometimes, right? You have variance on the order of the mean. Um, and when that happens, uh, if there are two related genes, you might actually have to take uncertainty into account to understand which one of them is highly exposed. Okay, so now I have the motivating problem. How should we in general address this problem? What's the computational challenge here? What we would like to do is let the data speak for themselves. Um, I would like to look at an RNA-seq experiment after quantification, having some notion of the posterior distribution, and I would like to ask, what are the inferentially distinguishable groups of transcripts? What are the things that I should consider as transcriptional units upon which I should do my analysis, upon which I should do my differential testing, etc.? Right? So we're looking to replace either individual transcripts or individual genes as the fundamental unit of quantification and differential testing. So um, it turns out that um, there was a, that Turo was quite prolific. Um, the same person who first introduced these general equivalence classes for sufficient statistics to speed up inference, um, only two years later uh, had this, I think, vastly underappreciated paper, um, which introduced uh, differential expression testing methodology at the transcript level that takes into account uncertainty derived by Gibbs sampling. And furthermore, suggests specifically a mechanism to solve this problem. So this quote, taken directly from the paper, says, often sets of transcripts with poorly estimated expression parameters are anti-correlated because reads can be mapped to the combined set of transcripts with confidence, but no read can be mapped to specific transcripts within the set. In these circumstances, it may be more informative to treat the sets of transcripts as a unit of inference rather than the individual transcripts. We now propose an algorithm, dot, dot, dot. Okay? Um, and so this, you know, I think uh, we read this paper, uh, the, the student who led this project, uh, Hirak Sarkar, um, you know, and I read this paper together, and he was uh, inspired by it, and we decided to try out the software. And unfortunately, what we found is that as the uh, complexity of the transcriptome increases, as the number of expressed transcripts increases, um, th there's computational limitations, right? The runtime of this, this sort of starts to um, explode. And furthermore, um, there were some, some interesting sort of methodological choices that we thought could potentially be made better. <laughs> so we were largely inspired by this, by this work. Uh, the tool that does this is called MM Collapse. It's a method for collapsing sets of transcripts. Um, but we decided to write our own tool, 
and develop our own method that, that, that tackles this problem. So uh, the tool that, that does this is a tool called Terminus. Um, it's freely available. Uh, it's open source on GitHub. Um, and it is also, I'm, I'm very proud to say this, I'm sort of a, um, a programming languages nerd PI. Um, it's my, my lab's first tool that's written in Rust, uh, which, is a, which is a programming language, um, a relatively new programming language. So um, this, this is the tool. Uh, I want to give you an idea of the kind of things that we're, we're able to do. So the goal here is to find groups of transcripts that independently have large inferential uncertainty, but when grouped together, they can be confidently quantified. And so this example is actually a pair of transcripts that are grouped by terminus. And so what you're looking at here is, um, on the x-axis, iterations of Gibbs sampling. This is thinned by a factor of 16, but just sort of imagine each point along the x-axis is the number of reads attributed to the orange transcript in that iteration of the Gibbs sampling, whereas the blue is another highly related transcript. And hopefully something you can see from this plot is that there's a strong anti-correlation between these abundances. When the orange transcript is low, the blue transcript is high, and vice versa, there are these inflection points where they switch. But if you sum them together, you get this green trace. These are the summed Gibbs samples, and the variation there is quite low. Okay? So we're very confident in that green abundance. And so this is an actual pair of transcripts that our algorithm is able to find. So what's the goal? How do we go about quantifying this particular metric and formalizing this problem? So uh, we're going to employ an iterative algorithm that tries to collapse groups of transcripts that are good candidates for collapse. What do I mean by good candidate? This is a thing that we have to quantify. So the uh, metric that we chose uh, is different than the one that's adopted by MM Collapse. Rather than anti-correlation, we choose to look at the reduction in inferential relative variance after we combine the set of transcripts, basically take their Gibbs samples and sum them together. So specifically, we're going to define for a transcript or group of transcripts VI and another transcript or group of transcripts VJ, the score of combining them to be given by the inferential variance of the sum of the Gibbs samples of these two transcripts or transcript groups minus the average of the individual inferential relative variances. So this is an interesting score because when it's large and negative, that actually means this is a really good thing. That means that the inferential relative variance of the group is much lower than the average inferential relative variance of the members that you grouped together. Um, so we're searching. We have a search procedure that looks for transcripts and groups of transcripts that give uh, good scores. Um, what I'm showing here is a scatter plot of these scores on a full transcriptome experiment. So uh, zero, uh, I, I maybe should have shaded this by density. Um, most transcript pairs fall along the zero line because they're independent and grouping them together doesn't make a big difference. Um, some transcripts are highly correlated and uh, you actually get increases in their, um, in their inferential relative variance if you group them together. But the things we want to group are the things below this red line, right? So what we want to find is some threshold below which the reduction in inferential relative variance is a surprising thing. We wouldn't have expected that by chance grouping these things together would be so good. And those are exactly the things that we want to group. So I'll talk in a few slides about how we choose this threshold. We have a data-driven uh, algorithm for doing that, but I just want to give you an overview of the idea here, right? So given all possible pairs of transcripts that we can group together, we want to search explicitly for the ones that give low values. So what's the problem here? Um, there's, a, there's a computational problem, which is that if I look at all of the transcripts in the transcriptome, if for example in human there's approximately 200,000 annotated transcripts, there are key choose two pairs that I should consider, right? If I want to consider all pairs of transcripts. Um, but the insight here is that not all pairs are important. Another way of saying this is almost all pairs of transcripts should not be grouped together, right? Transcripts from different gene families, transcripts from completely unrelated uh, genomic loci that are both functionally distinct and distinct in terms of their positions should probably not be grouped together. So what we want is a way to call the search space to focus in on only those transcripts that are likely to yield good scores, that are likely to be good candidates for collapse. The idea here is to make use of the equivalence classes to do that efficiently. So what we're going to do is we're going to view this as a graph problem. So consider that I process an experiment and I get a set of equivalence classes out. So just like that table I showed a few slides ago, 
there is a pattern of multi-mapping, a distinct set of transcripts where the reads map, and an associated count. And so now the idea is I'm going to derive a graph that's directly induced by these equivalence classes, where every vertex is a transcript, and a pair of vertices is connected by an edge if and only if they co-occur within the label of some equivalence class, meaning if and only if they share some set of reads. And these are the transcripts that I'm going to consider as being candidates for collapse. The motivation being here that between any pair of transcripts that might have um, a good score, a large reduction in the inferential relative variance, they should either be connected by an edge or there should be some short path between them, right? They should be able to be correlated in some way. So how do we do this efficiently? That's, that's the question. Um, and here is something that I think is particularly fun. So um, we were thinking about what's a good algorithm to do this, and something that jumped out at us immediately was uh, this paper that I recalled from back in the day when I, I did research in computer graphics, um, which is this paper from 1997 uh, by Michael Garland and Paul Heckbert for uh, surface simplification, right? So the title of the paper is Surf Surface Simplification Using Quadric Error Metrics. And so here, the, a picture is worth a thousand words, and so there's at least 3,000 words at the top here. The goal is to take this highly tessellated mesh and to reduce the number of triangles in it while visually retaining the shape, right? And so the idea is we want to sort of optimally collapse pairs of vertices such that when we take that, when we collapse that edge and reduce <coughs> two vertices to one, the shape of the bunny remains the same as much as possible. Okay, so here there's almost 70,000 triangles. You can reduce it by a factor of 70 and still get something that looks like this. So uh, our algorithm, well first let me tell you the coarse grain level how this algorithm works because I think it's a nice clever idea. The idea is you look at all possible edges, you score what the uh, cost of collapsing them would be, and you put all those scores in a mini heap so you can accurately and quickly uh, extract the minimum element. Um, and while you've not exceeded your approximation budget, you extract the edge that would be the best one to collapse, you collapse it, you rescore all of the adjacent vertices, so all the things that are now connected to your new vertex, and you put them back in the heap. That's it, right? Um, so it's a greedy algorithm, does a great job in practice. So we're going to do the same thing, except our graph is a graph of transcripts that are connected by reads, and our score is the score of collapsing these things. Okay, so the algorithm looks like this. Uh, put all edges from this fragment ambiguity graph into a min heap, keyed by the score. While the best collapse is still better than the threshold that we choose, we pick the best edge, we group those transcripts together, and we update the neighborhood of the newly created vertex and rescore the edges. Put them back in the heap. Okay? So um, it's a simple law loop until we exceed our score threshold. So uh, visually, the algorithm looks like this. There's basically two steps. We first determine the threshold for to stop collapsing. We construct the graph and we filter it. And then we just do this loop, right? We store all the edges, we pop the best one, we collapse the edge, um, we put the collapsed edge back in the min heap, and we do this until no edge exists in our graph that would give us a score below our threshold. So the only uh, question that remains is what do we mean by collapse an edge? So there's uh, three cases here. Um, sort of generic, so I'm going to collapse vertex J into vertex I, and the case here is that there exists an edge that is connected to VJ, but not to VI, so that's with this vertex X. In that case, what's going to happen is uh, vertex X is going to be connected to VI in our collapsed graph. The reason for that is we're going to be merging VJ into VI, so now VI represents the group of transcripts VJ plus VI. Right, so everything that was connected to this now needs to be connected to this. Uh, the second case is a trivial one. If the edge was not connected to VJ, then nothing changes. Um, and then the last case is what if both of the edges were connected to VJ? Um, sorry, connected to X. Then uh, the only thing that changes is the output edge is going to continue to be connected to VI, but the set of equivalence classes that label that edge is going to be the union of these two sets. Okay? Um, and then we're going to update the score in the following way. Right? So this just tells you how you sum together the give samples of the things that are being collapsed and score the new edges. So that's the collapsing algorithm. 
Um, I'm not going, so there's pseudocode here, I'm not going to walk through this, but this is the, the very simple algorithm for selecting the threshold. Let me give you the basic idea. We're going to define a background distribution of scores based on random transcript pairs. Right? So the idea is choose a large number of random pairs of transcripts, ones that are not necessarily connected in this graph. We're going to look at the distribution and estimate the tail. So specifically, we're going to estimate the 2.5% quantile. And we're going to get a value for the scores of these random pairs of vertices that are in the lowest 2.5% of all scores. That gives us a threshold. What we want to know is if our estimate is good enough, if we had looked at more random pairs, would this have changed? So we're going to repeatedly double the size of the pairs that we're sampling until this threshold stops changing. Right? Um, then when we're done, that's our threshold. And so the motivation here is uh, among random pairs, we're only going to potentially falsely collapse the ones that are the most surprising, but most of the transcripts that should be collapsed should definitely be below this threshold. So when we run our algorithm, uh, what this plot is showing is on the x-axis iterations of the collapsing algorithm, and on the y-axis the, the score uh, that we got from the collapse, you can see behavior that you would hopefully expect from a, a greedy iterative algorithm. Um, the, the best scores are collapsed first, uh, and then we sort of quickly plateau until we reach our score threshold. There's some interesting behavior here where you can see that we had a higher score and then quickly go down to a lower score. This happens when we collapse uh, a transcript into some group, and now when we look at the new edges that are connected to that group, there's some other highly um, high-scoring pair, right? So basically, I have a transcript that's highly correlated with something, I merge it into a group, and now that group has high anti-correlation with some other transcript, okay? So even though it's pairwise, you can get larger groups. Wouldn't this threshold be dependent on the k-mer size? Uh, there's, no, there's no k mers here. There's, there, so the algorithm is, is working on the basis of transcript expression. So what we have are estimated uh, abundances and the posterior distribution of abundances. So there's, uh, there's no k-mers, so to speak, in this algorithm. Like at the beginning, how do you, like you need to align your reads to transcripts, right? Yeah, so okay, so this uh, is based on Great question, uh, but uh, maybe not obvious one. So the question is, well, you got the quantification somehow. So the algorithm is actually agnostic to how you got the quantifications. Um, you can do this by aligning the reads with an aligner. You can do, use this by using sort of a fast camera-based alignment approach. Um, here, we'll, for this particular plot, we use our tool Salmon uh, with selective alignment, which is a method that um, does fast mapping, but then validates the mappings using alignment scoring. And so here, um, the, the, this is on synthetic data, so the, the data is actually quite clean, um, and so we're not really missing anything by choosing a particular key for size. But typically, but, if you do like uh, good enough alignments here, yep. like uh, the collapsing uh, transcript would be less and less. Um, okay, right. So I mean, it's true that if you have uncertainty due to poor quality alignment, then you're going to have more uncertainty. You're going to collapse more things, yep. right? Um, but here. The, the alignment procedure actually is, is quite like a regular alignment procedure. I mean, there's a fast algorithm underlying it, which I'd be happy to talk about in more detail, maybe offline, but we're actually aligning the read at the end of the day. Like, we have a position for the read that we've computed via some fast method, and then we validate the alignment score at that position using actually the KSW uh, algorithm of uh, Penny right? So, so these are, I think, quite accurately aligned Good question. Um, okay, so now let me sort of tell you about the experiments and the results here. So to evaluate this, we looked at both simulated and experimental data. We have two simulated data sets. The first one is a, a full transcriptome simulation data in human, uh, a multi-sample four by four experiment. Um, the second is full transcriptome of a single sample uh, in, a, in a simulated allele-specific mouse transcriptome. So we took two different strains of, of mouse and we looked at um, allele-specific transcript expression. Uh, and then some experimental data in Drosophila. Uh, this is a subset of the, the common uh, the popular Facilla data set. Um, it was used actually in the original MM Collapse paper. So uh, the first thing is, let me throw up some scatter plots. So uh, what I'm showing here is the true count for transcripts um, abundances versus the estimated count under, so salmon, this is at the individual transcript level. This is using collapse with MM Collapse. And this is using collapsing with terminals. 
All right, so it's, it's, uh, scatter plots are nice as an overall gestalt for what's happening, but I want to draw your attention to um, the areas where uh, Terminus is doing a good job here, right? So we can see that there's a lot of things that are highly misestimated. They have a true count of zero, but a high predicted count that Terminus is able to eliminate. Um, there's generally less noise in this off-diagonal region. Um, and the same thing here, uh, which is places where the estimated abundance is zero, but the true abundance is not zero. Okay, so it reduces those kinds of errors. And if we look at some coarse-grained global metric here, the mean, uh, the mean absolute relative difference, so just basically the the uh, absolute difference of the estimate minus the truth over the sum of the estimate and the truth, and we keep the mean of that over all transcript pairs, we reduce the, the MAR from 0.11 in salmon to 0.09 in terminus. If we dig down a little bit deeper, um, we can look at what's happening in specific cases. So the, this is the histogram of um, log 10 of the estimated abundance when the true abundance is zero and the estimated abundance is at least one. Um, so what you can see here is that actually MM collapse tends to vastly overestimate the abundance of non-expressed transcripts, um, but otherwise, yeah, it's a little bit hard to see, there's green bars here where blue bars are not here, right? So Terminus is doing less overestimation of transcripts that are actually not present. Uh, down here is the opposite case. Okay, so these are transcripts where the estimation is less than one, and then this is the true count of those things. Um, so this is sort of underestimation. And so here you can see that actually salmon is sort of the outlier. It's over-predicting um, the abundance of, uh, sorry, under-predicting the abundance of these transcripts. Um, MM collapse is in the middle, and then terminus is doing the best. Uh, and then the last plot here is just the residual. So if we look at things where the relative difference from the prediction of the truth is either greater than 0.5 or less than negative 0.5, we can see um, the error for having a residual that is negative or having a residual that is positive. In all of these cases, Terminus is, is doing the best job of minimizing the residual. Um, so that's simulated full transcriptome data. Uh, it turns out to be even harder with allele-specific data because many transcript variants are determined only by one or a small number of SNPs, right? So they're very, very highly similar transcripts. Um, so the way that we did this is we used the reference mouse transcriptome and annotated variants from the NOD and PWK reference and then we created a diploid transcriptome using G2G tools, and we simulated from that. Um, so I'm going to show the same set of plots, so I, I won't explain them in quite as much detail. Uh, these are the scatter plots. <coughs> sort of harder to see what's going on here, but uh, there's some noise around the diagonal that, that goes away when you use terminus. Um, there's, there's fewer mispredictions in the same places where there were mispredictions before uh, using salmon. Um, and here something actually quite interesting happens. Um, there's a lot of this uh, misestimation by MM collapse when the truth is zero and the estimate is greater than one, but in this particular case, there's actually quite a bit of misestimation in the other direction when the estimate is zero and the true abundance is non-zero, uh, dominated here by salmon, but then terminus cleans it up quite a bit. Um, and then these are the residuals again. Okay, so um, the other thing that we computed in this allele-specific uh, scenario is places where there was a misprediction of the dominant allele. So what I mean by that are places where we estimated the abundance of allele A to be higher than the abundance of allele B, well in truth, the opposite was the case, right? Um, so salmon by itself mispredicted about 10% of the, the time the dominant allele. Here, both MM collapse and terminus reduce this by more than a factor of two. So the dominant allele misprediction goes down from 10% to 4% in both these cases. So you're getting fewer than half as many wrong dominant allele predictions by doing this collapse. The last thing I want to mention in terms of the quality of the results is um, on experimental data. So it's obviously hard to make a strong quantitative statement about being right or wrong here, but what we can look at is the biological plausibility of the things that we're, we're creating, the groups that we're making. So what I'm showing here is uh, blue is terminus and orange is MM collapse. And this is a histogram of the number of originating genes that contribute to a group. So how many times the transcripts in a group come from a single gene? Um, that is the majority of cases. So most of the time when you group transcripts together, if you had the annotation and you looked at it, they would be from the same gene. But terminus or and MM collapse, in fact, know nothing about the annotation, right? So it's purely data driven. There, there is a longer tail here. So there are groups that come from multiple genes, but a lot of the time those come from only a small number of gene families. 
So this right plot is showing the same thing, except grouping by gene family rather than by gene. So um, to sort of conclude here, in, in experimental data, we have no ground truth, but we can say that these groups do look reasonable. Uh, when they um, come from different genes, they usually come from one or two gene families. And we did find some interesting things here. So there was one group that was giant, had 54 transcripts. And when we actually dug into it, it turned out to be from this paragene, which is annotated with 60 very similar transcripts, right? So in, in this case, it was actually grouping together a large number of transcripts, so there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, the last thing that I want to say about Terminus, and this is part of the motivation for initially developing it, um, is that it's a very efficient tool, right? So the, the problem we ran into when we were running um, MM Collapse is that as the number of expressed transcripts grows large, the complexity of the algorithm and the memory usage both sort of explode because it's computing all pairwise correlations between expressed transcripts. So here um, in the simulated human data, uh, MM Collapse took about 370 gigabytes of memory to run to completion, um, and it took about three hours and 46 minutes to complete while Terminus took about 2.8 gigs of memory in two minutes to complete. Um, in the mouse data, this is the allele-specific data, uh, uh, MM Collapse took about 225 gigs of memory, Terminus took about 485 megabytes of memory, um, and MM Collapse took 38 hours to complete, and Terminus completed in less than a minute. Um, and then in the Drosophila data, so this is, this is actually interesting, this is the data that was used in the original MM Collapse paper. Right? You can see, for that data, their runtime is completely reasonable, um, this is because there were fewer expressed transcripts here. So it took about four gigs of memory and completed in about eight minutes, which is totally fine, right? Um, terminus is faster here, but the difference there is, is not um, a matter of being able to run it, say, on the limited memory machine versus not, right? So the, the reason for this, the, the, the reason I wanted to just point this out, is the difference here is due to the nature of the algorithm, right? We, we re replace a pairwise comparison between a bunch of different things with a uh, graph algorithm that's highly sparse. So the number of, of comparisons you have to do is, is vastly reduced. So in conclusion, um, there's a few take home points here. Um, quantification can be done on a spectrum, where at one end are genes and at the other end are transcripts. But um, I'm, I, I want to sort of suggest, maybe don't choose either of those a priori, right? Let the data themselves dictate what the resolution the analysis should be done at is. Uh, grouping transcripts into inferentially distinguishable groups improves quantification accuracy and robustness. Uh, the groups we find are biologically meaningful under known annotations, even though the algorithm itself has no knowledge of these annotations. Um, and we can apply the same ideas here that we're looking at for transcript-level ambiguity in bulk RNA-seq data to gene-level ambiguity in tagged in data, right? So uh, tagged in single-cell data. So in single-cell data, there's um, sometimes considerably more ambiguity at the gene level because you're looking usually at a single read that has informative sequence because the other read is used for uh, barcode and UMI tags, right? Um, so you can apply the same kind of ideas there. There is one big challenge here, though, which is that both the transcript annotation and the gene annotation are fixed things. I can compare them arbitrarily across experiments. A gene in experiment A means the same thing as that gene in experiment B, but the groups are data-driven. And so one downside of being data-driven is that the groups can change between experiments. So we should think about how to do that kind of comparison in a meaningful way. Um, and so finally, I'd like to uh, thank all the members of my lab, uh, two of whom were recently graduated within the past uh, three months, um, as well as my collaborators on Terminus. So uh, Hirak, my PhD student, is a lead author of this, um, and as well my collaborator Hector Corrado Bravo at, at Maryland, and uh, Mike Love at UNC, uh, as well as my funders. Thank you.